The hour being seven o'clock on Monday, May 17th, 2021. I'd like to call to order the um, Laconia City Council uh, meeting uh, for budget presentations. Um, prior to beginning the meeting, I'd like to read the introduction for electronic meetings and appreciate you bearing with me on this. As mayor of the Laconia City Council, due to the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis in accordance with Governor Sununu's emergency order number 12, Pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this board is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen to the meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, this is to confirm that we are, A, providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video or other electronic means. We are utilizing the Zoom platform for this electronic meeting. All members have the ability to communicate during this meeting through the Zoom platform, and the public has access to watch the live YouTube video at www.youtube.com forward slash Laconia NH. Listen to this meeting through dialing the following number, 1-646-558-8656, or participate by the Zoom app, webinar ID 843-8268-9358, the password of 816-847-B, providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of how to access the meeting using Zoom, and instructions are provided on the City of Laconia's website at www.laconianh.gov. C, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anybody has a problem, please call. 527-1265, extension 243, or email at cityclerk at laconianh.gov. And D, adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, we will adjourn the meeting and have it rescheduled at that time. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. So let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states his presence, also please state, whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. I would ask City Clerk Cheryl Hebert to please call the roll. Councilor Cheney. Council Chambers. Councilor Susie. Home and alone. Councilor Whitman. Home in this room alone, <clears throat> um, have family in the house. Councilor Haynes. In Council Chambers. Councilor Hamill. Home and alone. Councilor Phelps. Home and alone. Mayor Hosmer. I am home and I am alone. Um, joining us this evening is our recording secretary, the aforementioned city clerk, Cheryl Hebert. Uh, also joining us is Scott Myers, a city manager, and Glenn Smith, the finance manager. I see on our agenda here, we didn't put a Pledge of Allegiance, but I would think now would be the appropriate time to have a Pledge of Allegiance. allegiance and I'd ask uh, Councillor Hamill, if you'd be so kind as to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States, United of, America. States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for, which it stands, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible and liberty, liberty and justice and justice. justice. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hamill. Thank you. Moving right along here under item five, which is our presentations this evening. We'll be leading off with department budget presentations and that's being done by Laconia Fire Department. And I see Chief Kirk Fiati joining with us, or joining us. Welcome. Thank you. Um, just for uh, purposes that aren't in the room with me, but they're online with me. I have uh, Assistant Chief Ellingson and Deputy Chief Bean with me tonight. Um, joining us and uh, I want to thank you for having us tonight and uh, look forward to going through the, the budget process and uh, answering any questions I can uh, answer for you. So I do have a PowerPoint presentation and um, that I will do. I'm going to look like I do this correctly here. Look at that. Everybody see that okay? All right, perfect. In, uh, you should have in your in the document that I had forwarded through 
the city clerk, you should have a uh, my year end review. This is one of the incidents that has a couple pages in the year end review. This was Dyer Street. Um, the only reason I put that in there is for you to, um, when you read that and, and note that this was probably our largest residential fire we've had in the last 25 years. Um, and the one thing that's that I really uh, interesting to note on this is we had at least three different departments there. We always talk about our mutual aid and how good our mutual aid is. We work really well with our surrounding partners. There was at least three departments in here that we, um, to the best of our knowledge and to the best of their knowledge, had never been to the city of Laconia for a fire. Um, they came up and helped us that night. Um, it was a 16 hour fire. We were there um, and, you know, Crews did an outstanding job and it's a couple page document in uh, or part of that document and I just uh, it was definitely worth sharing with you. I want to start off by just, uh, you know, it is with my sincerest appreciation I thank all the members of the Laconia Fire Department for their incredible work during 2020. Uh, this year, certainly I think we would all agree has been like nothing else that we've seen certainly nothing like I've had to deal with in my career, um, but we continue to day by day weather the storm. I'm going to briefly talk about um, COVID here in a few minutes, very briefly, uh, but I want to make sure that I don't miss the opportunity to thank Mayor Hosmer, you guys as Laconia City Council and City Manager Myers um, for everything you did for us as departments and department heads during this pandemic. Uh, being able to be told, get done what you need to do, take care of what you need to take care of, get us through this um, was, um, not ex unexpected and it was very refreshing and we knew you would do that for us and you did and it, it meant a lot and uh, we were able to really be successful during this whole event i also want to make sure and i didn't put it in here but i also want to make sure i thank uh, finance director glenn smith for all of his work during this uh COVID with the financial piece of it normally on a simple event like a big storm when we're trying to get reimbursements uh the department that is most uh, most affected would do all that work, uh, get trying to get FEMA reimbursements or state reimbursements for financial. Uh, Glenn took that on from the beginning. We filtered all of our information to him, which we've been doing now for over a year. Um, and it, uh, it has eased up our jobs. It's made his harder, but it certainly has eased up our job and uh, it's worth uh, saying thank you for that. During 2020, we uh, we had some retirements and departures. Um, Administrative Fire Secretary Trish Balvaney had to retire uh, to deal with some personal issues. Uh, those are going well, and she's actually been back with us doing some part-time work, helping get the office squared away, um, working with our new Administrative Fire Secretary, and it's been really nice to have her around again. Firefighter Chuck Campbell retired. Uh, he, uh, he had worked with us in two different stints, worked in Guilford in between, uh, but Chuck was also a military veteran, and we had uh, lost him for a year in the early 2000s when he went over to Iraq. So he was a great employee to have, and uh, we're going to miss him as well. Normally, I don't add in people that leave and that are here for a very short amount of time, but, uh, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned firefighter Megan Hempel. She worked with us for only two months. Um, unfortunately, she was injured on an incident, uh, on, the, on the job accident um while she was uh, on a medical call and she worked for about she was here with us for two months she worked for almost 10 months trying to get back to work um unfortunately she wasn't able to uh, so she had to leave us early um you know the big reason why i mentioned that is obviously for because it was an injury but also um even in the first two months we knew she was going to be a very good employee um but unfortunately we, she was not able to return we did a couple of recognitions during the year that I want to make sure I mention. Um, on Christmas Day, we had a fire in Union Ave uh, at, a, at a, as you all know about it, um, at a commercial occupancy. Above it was an apartment. Uh, when crews first arrived, they were told that they believed to be an occupant still in the building uh, upstairs. Our crews went in with uh, our thermal imaging cameras, found the person, carried him out. He was unable to evacuate on his own carried him through the thick smoke, got him outside to the point where he didn't need to be transported to the hospital. We treated him on scene. Um, so those two gentlemen were uh, given a internal award for that. And as it was well documented, uh, we had uh, four, uh, we've had four total deliveries 
three baby deliveries within this uh, within the calendar year of 2020, um, and those were listed there as well. As I said, I'm not going to talk all night about COVID because I, I don't think anybody wants me to talk all night about COVID. Um, certainly the two department heads going after me don't want me to talk all night about this. Uh, but I do want to just make a couple of quick mentions. Um, it, it's important to note that the pre-planning and the communication that we had in the city during before this pandemic and during um, is really what made our response work so well. We've been working on this for well over a decade, and it was always one of those ones where we can expect a flood, we can expect an ice storm, we can expect, you know, a major snowstorm. We were not expecting the pandemic one to come through, even though we talked about it all the time, and we prepared for it and we trained for it through our public health network. Um, but everything we did to prepare for it made a big difference, um, and the communication was outstanding. All the department heads talked all the time. Um, certainly dealing with the mayor, the council, the city manager, almost on a daily basis um, was uh, was outstanding. We talked, I talked to the superintendent of schools almost every day as well. And it was just, it was so nice to see all this work exactly how you would want it to. For us, the unknowns were the hardest part. Um, I feel, I feel for our employees, especially the ones going out on the ambulance every day, it was always that unknowns. Are we going to a COVID patient? Did we protect ourselves correctly? Um, does the patient who doesn't exhibit any signs, do they have COVID? Um, it, it was tough. And then for me, they would come to us and say, and my administrative staff, and they would ask us questions and we didn't always have the answer. Um, and we were on the on conference calls every day getting these answers. Early on in the incident, we were doing um, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 hours a week, just on conference calls. Um, and we were getting all the answers we could, but everything was changing so fast. So it was very difficult, um, but we've been getting through it. Moving into 2021, things are going well. Um, our, uh, many of our staff have taken a frontline role in working at the state's fix sites for giving vaccinations. Um, we've also worked at LRGH, or now Concord Hospital, um, giving vaccinations. We did it here um, to the fire station. So we're really taking a lead role in, in working at these sites. I haven't even spoken to the city manager about this yet, but my long-term goal as emergency management director is hopefully in the fall to be able to gather all of our department heads um, and put together what we call an after action report. We do it after major incidents in the fire department. So we have something to present um, to you guys at a, at a council meeting after the budget's cleared and all that's taken care of probably in the fall. Um, just to talk about what we did. And so you can see some of those minor um, unseen things that went on during, during COVID. Our overdose response numbers continue to decrease. As you can see there, uh, we had 46 in calendar year 2020. And I think it's important to note that everything I'm talking about in here is calendar year, um, not fiscal year. It's just easier to break down for these reports. Um, we continue to provide a recovery coach services um, I believe we have five people now that are recovery coach certified, um, but those requests for services are going down and that's exactly what we want to see. Uh, though that group still continues to work with our uh, stakeholders in town and um, in, in these recovery coach services, but the amount of calls they're getting are, are, have decreased and we hopefully they keep going in that direction. Our incident totals for the year you'll see was had decreased. Um, by 348 from 2019, <clears throat> it had us doing 12 calls a day in 2020 as opposed to 13. So when you look at it in the grand scheme, it's one call a day difference. Um, and it is clear and I, everything else was pretty much uh, stayed the same. But as you can see, I'm gonna go to the next slide. As you can see, um, it really was COVID that made the difference. I and mean, you hate to keep calling everything with COVID related, but if you look at these numbers, um, from January to June, which was really that onset, 343 of the 348 call decrease was in those first six months. Um, that's when people weren't going out of the house. We weren't getting the car accidents that we normally go to. People didn't want to go to the hospital. Uh, even if they were really sick, they weren't calling us. Um, so that was where our biggest decrease in, number, in calls were. The rest of the year, we decreased five, five calls from the year before. Uh, to take out COVID, we would have been up. 
Um, and as you can see, it jumped into December. We had a record number of December calls of 401. And in the first four months of this year, uh, we're already seeing us right back on par with where we have been the last few years. I get asked this question a lot, how many times we transport outside of um, Laconia Hospital, Lake Street General Hospital. Um, 2019 to 20, you see we did 23 and 29. These are one of two things. Uh, either we transported from the hospital to another hospital, uh, which was generally conquered, uh, or we bypassed the hospital and went from the scene in Laconia to Concord Hospital. Uh, we would do that for uh, obstetric calls, for baby delivery calls, or we would do it uh, for uh, a certain type of a cardiac incident. And now even for some major traumas, we're doing this as well. Uh, but it's, you know, on average, right around twice a month. Um, so it's not a whole lot. With the sale of, uh, even though this was in this calendar year, with the sale of LRGH to Concord Hospital, we have been working with them closely from our emergency medical services side of it. Uh, we've had already had a few meetings with their, um, their EMS coordinator and making sure that, you know, the services we provide um, aren't going to change to the residents uh, of Laconia. We don't want anything to change. And it's only the small, small sample size, obviously. It's been, what, less than a month. Um, we have not seen any, any changes, nothing. We have an increase in, le in going to another hospital. We haven't, um, we haven't seen any decrease in services. So I think for, in, like I said, very small sample size, but, um, very positive so far. In incidents by district, I like to put this up. This hasn't changed. Um, very minimal numbers, obviously the central, south, downtown area of Laconia. Uh, is going to be the highest. It's always going to be the highest, um, but really not a lot of changes in, in that. Our response time analysis, uh, we have different metrics that we use, but the eight minute, we want to be at 90%. Uh, eight minutes is a long time to respond, uh, but we do have parts of town that we just have trouble getting to any less time than that. Um, as you can see, it has, there was a decrease uh, when you do that math on there, it's about 130 call difference um, in that small percentage change. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of them, we were seeing that we had um, an increased amount of time that we were decon in the ambulances this year. You know, we always make sure that it's clean in between patients. Um, but with COVID, we were spraying on the special stuff that we had to spray on and it had to wait to clean so we couldn't just wipe it up real quick and take another call. So that actually probably increased our response time on some of the multiple incidents we had. Our, um, and with that, our overlapping incidents uh, that we look at, almost 40%, uh, almost 39% of our emergency incidents occurred while we were handling one other incident. So when you see two ambulances out on calls and you see an engine out also, they are probably dealing with um, more than one call at a time. Uh, because as you saw in the last slide, I didn't mention it, 68% of our time, we did send one, only one unit to an incident. And we try to do that as much as we can. I was asked to do this a couple of years ago um, and we brought this up. This is a five-year analysis of our, of our um, loss and save analysis that we call it. So, of all the building fires we went to in the last five years, our pre-fire value of those buildings that we went into was um, almost $21 million. Our total um, loss was almost 6 million. It put us at a 71% save rate. And again, these are, these are building fires that actually had fire. They were not a, you know, if we had a, a small oven fire in a $2 million home, we don't consider we saved $2 million worth of property. These are actual, or we're pulling hose, putting out fire, um, uh, and, and you know to put us at 71% save rate, almost 72% is something we should be very proud of. We get there early, um, we get there quick, and when we have all the manpower not out on other calls, we do a really good job at at putting out a lot of fire. Um, so the, the numbers right there is something we should be very all should be very proud of. Getting into a little bit more of this year's stuff. Um, I wanted to get, uh, talk about some capital improvement. 
So two things to talk about. Engine five is in service. Picture of it there. It's up at the Weirs Beach Station. Um, we uh, dedicated it to the memory of Lieutenant Mike Shastany, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, or sorry, last year. Yeah, after a couple year battle of, with cancer, um, he was on the department for almost 25 years. Served a lot of his time as lieutenant in the Weir Station. So the uh, one of the first things the committee did was. Um, before we knew what we wanted to have for a truck, they knew that who they wanted to dedicate it to. So if you're in the Weirs area, stop in, check it out. You'll see a couple different um, things that are on the truck to, to memorize him. And so that's really nice. I'll memorialize him rather. So it's really nice. Um, before we move on from the engine, I just want to say thank you to the, I'm not going to name them all by name, but the, uh, the truck committee that we put together did an outstanding job in building this uh, piece of fire apparatus. They were told two very simple things for me. I wanted a, I'm not into bells and whistles. I want a simple fire truck. And I told them the amount of money we had to spend. Um, and they they did more work than I can even imagine in, in building this. Um, they, they looked at every little aspect of this truck to make sure it was everything we wanted um, and that we kept them in line at the shop. Uh, it was built out of state. Uh, every time they would send us an update, we sent them a question. <laughs> I don't think they were expecting that, um, but we did. And uh, so the committee did an outstanding job and I really appreciate that. Uh, the Weir's fire station was uh, the, oops, the Weir's fire station. Uh, renovation is underway, almost completed. Um, the only thing we have left to do is put carpet down uh, and it'll be done. Uh, unfortunately, the person that we had or that we uh, awarded the bid to for the carpet, passed away, unable to complete it, obviously. Um, so we um, just got it approved to go through a different vendor um, and that's gonna be done within the next couple of weeks. And as soon as it's done, it looks uh, it looks beautiful. They did a wonderful job. Look forward to having you all updated to take a look at it. For fiscal year 22, the capital improvement um, items on our list are the replacement of the self-contained breathing apparatus, our air packs. Those are coming up on um, their expiration date. They're good for 15 years. Um, they're coming up on expiration. We're going to need to buy new ones. Um, so that's why they're, they've, been in, they've been in the CIP for the last couple of years and um, looking to get them funded this year. Um, we have tried on a couple of different grant applications um, unsuccessfully. Uh, to work on this, so we have been trying that route. Um, they just has just hasn't happened for us. We haven't been successful with it. Um, and then the utility pickup truck um, for the for the department as well. Looking forward beyond twenty two, um, ladder truck replacement, ladder two, ladder one. Um, for anybody who was uh, on the council when we bought ladder two, uh, ladder one rather the the tower truck. It's hard to believe the truck is twelve years old now. Seems like we bought it a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, we're not looking to replace that, but we do need to get ladder two replaced. So we're not trying to replace two trucks like that within the same few years. Um, I'm still trying to replace the forestry truck. Uh, we bought the, the tank and hose unit, I think two budget cycles ago now, um, which would transfer into the new truck. Um, and this would, this would, so this would be the actual pickup truck piece of it. Uh, when I looked at renovating the Weir station, I was asked to put it in phases, which is what we did. Um, so we did the, the living area. The next phase would be to um, renovate the apparatus base, professionally have it clean, painted, um, and renovated in there. Um, that's something we're, we're looking at different options to do that now. Uh, we know it'll be a couple of years before we can do it, but you know, we just want to try to keep this in line. Uh, we need to replace engine two at some point, which is our spare truck downtown. Right now it's a uh, 1991. Um, it is the same manufacturer that of the engine we just bought. So if that tells you anything, we bought a really solid piece of fire apparatus because it's going to last us for a long time. This truck has lasted a long time as well. Um, and then we're going to want to continue with the ambulance replacement schedule as well, which isn't necessarily fall under the CIP, but it, you know, it is a big ticket item um, that we'll just, we, we want to keep going with as well. In our salary and operational increases this year, 
uh, there is an increase in the overtime lines um, for um, to try to get us back to running at full staffing um, a large percentage of the time. My hope is to try to get it as much of the year as we can. Obviously, I understand that there, you know, we, we may get to points in the year where we can't. Um, you know, we're also going to try to avoid long-term vacancies, which really are difficult for us to do this on. Um, this is something I've been working on incrementally since I've been chief. It's my third budget cycle. Um, been incrementally, incrementally increasing as we move along. And we're at a point now where this is going to be um, to get us in a really big percentage of the time, um, which is, you know, something we've been trying to do for a while now. There were some increases in health insurance and retirement this year. Um, you'll see in my line, it's a very small increase, but you'll see some station maintenance repairs. Um, my hope is over the next couple of years, I'm going to try to where I can increase money um, in my what I consider the operational side, the non-salary side. I plan on trying to stick as much of it as I can into the station maintenance um, section. Um, we've been doing a really nice job keeping up with with this building. Obviously, I'm in Central Station. It's new, but it's been you know, it's been a few years now. We want to make sure that we're never getting behind in the maintenance, uh, which we haven't been, but I don't want to get behind either. So um, it could be um, a solid building for us for many, many, many years to come. There was also an increase um, in the Lake Shiger Mutual Fire Aid, our dispatch center increase this year. Um, it was a little bit bigger than it normally is for an increase. Uh, we've increased, um, we approved some of the capital improvement stuff that the district uses. Uh, bettering our radio communication stuff and our access to the regional hazardous materials team. So that's where that um, that's where that increase comes from. We're always discussing that how difficult it is to hire firefighters in the state. Uh, certainly, it's not a city just a city thing. It's not just a lakes region thing. It's statewide. It's really nationwide, but statewide's being hit really hard. Um, we've tried to be very proactive in this. Um, the department we hired a, uh, formed a hiring retention committee um, and they've been actively out recruiting firefighters. Uh, they've been doing a great job. Um, we've been, uh, they, we've actually had since that committee formed and they've been out actively recruiting. We've had at least four or five just in the last couple of weeks uh, put in applications to us because of the work they've done. Uh, so that group is, group is doing a really nice job. I worked uh, all spring with a marketing student from Plymouth State University. <clears throat> I see if anybody was looking for a job, uh, a, uh, a project, they were. Um, and they've helped us with some marketing, which I've been able to use. Um, and then we're looking at some other enticements that may have some small financial component, but we're really not ready to, to do a whole lot with that right now. And certainly this council approved us um, two years ago in being able to hire somebody at a higher rate. We haven't had the opportunity to do that, but uh, that's, that is always there for us to do. Well, lastly, some of my goals for next year, you know, the biggest one is going back to some business as usual. Um, it, you know, like I said at the beginning, nothing has been normal this year. Um, so we're gonna try to go back to business as usual, um, try to increase our training hours, uh, especially outside of the department. Outside training shut off uh, right around March last year and really hasn't picked up um, until, probably the last two months. Um, so we're getting out there, getting getting some of our training hours done, um, especially with some of those specialty classes that we just can't teach in house. Um, and my, you know, one of my biggest goals is to, to get our, to have a full roster. I have, currently have three vacancies um, that I'm really hopeful I'm gonna be able to fill within the next couple of weeks um, and to have a list to be able to pull from. Um, usually fire departments have lists of eight, 10, 12 people that they can hire from. So if somebody leaves, you just go out the next person on the list, call them up, see if you want a job. It is really difficult to formulate that list right now, anywhere across the state. Um, but that's our, that's our goal for the year. And, uh, um, hopefully that can become fruition because the last thing we want, it's so difficult when we have somebody retire or leave us to go to another department. And then it takes us three, four months to hire somebody. It's, it's, um, it, it's very difficult, but uh, hopefully we can pull that off this year. And I promised I would keep it short. Um, again, I wanna thank everybody um, for all that you do for us. And I, if you have any questions, I will be glad to take them.
I'm not sure how I get this. Uh, Mayor, can I ask a question? Uh, go ahead, Councillor Lippman. Okay. Thank you. I'd um, like to talk a little bit about Chief. Uh, thank, first of all, thank you for your good work this year. Um, just like to talk a little bit about the capital component of your budget and the, the ladder truck in particular and the ambulances in particular. Um, can you walk us through, are we gonna end up with two ladder trucks from your plan or uh, one, that's the first question. One, one new one to replace ladder two, which is in the weirs. Um, and so we'd have two total trucks in the city. Uh, ladder one, the tower truck that you see downtown at Central Station and then ladder two in the weirs. I guess just um, in terms of uh, us bearing 100% of the cost of that, um, you know, is two ladder trucks seems to be a bit of a luxury compared to what other surrounding communities um, might have, I guess, can you give us some comparison of some other like communities as to whether they have that amount of uh, apparatus? Uh, well, we've had two ladder trucks in the city since ladder trucks were made. I mean, I, I can't even remember the last time we did. I mean, some of, when I started, a couple of the ladder trucks that we had were, you know, already at the 50 year old mark, you know, not 50. They were probably, you know, 30 years old at that point. So we've always had two ladder trucks. Um, the there's a couple well a couple of reasons why we need the two is you know we you kind of touched on it we don't have any around us we have Meredith that has one uh, and they they come down and they do help us but they being a volunteer department they can't come help us instantly um, the other thing is the towns around us don't have the buildings that we have uh, we have a lot of buildings that need a ladder truck if we're gonna have a fire in it we're gonna need them quickly um, ladder trucks can't come a half an hour into an incident and be operationally successful. They really need to be early. Um, Cause once we start pulling hoses and doing all that, you're never gonna get close enough to the building. If one of our ladder trucks goes out of service and we don't have a second one, we don't have another one coming. So we will not, We it will be there. It'll be well over half an hour before we get it. Um, so not only does it help us uh, instantly but it also serves as our own backup if you will. Um, so we can take care of, we, we never run down without having at least one available to us. Um, the towns around us, um, the buildings that they call us to with the ladder truck um, are generally the ones that we can get to uh, relatively quickly. Um, you know, we go to Guilford with, and we, we may go to the Walmart Plaza or the Shaw's Plaza, something like that um, to set up. But, you know, that's why we need them. Um, and that's why we really need to. And just from a specification standpoint, uh, is there like, you know, in the ambulance sphere, you have some heavy duty ones and then you have more of the lighter lighter duty ones. What about ladder trucks? Yep. So if you, the ladder truck that we have downtown the, with the big bucket on the end, um, that is not what we're looking for. Um, if, in the Weir's ladder is a smaller ladder. It's got a smaller wheelbase. Um, it was really designed for that district, and we would be looking to do the same thing. So it's smaller than those larger ladder trucks that you would see. I mean, it's still a 75-foot ladder. Um, it's still a good-sized truck, obviously, uh, but it's not the same size as the one down here. It's smaller than the one we have out of Central, but it needs to be that way uh, because its primary district would be the Weirs. Even though it comes down and covers down here and goes to fires in the non-Weirs district, um, it is a smaller size vehicle than, than that uh, larger one we have. Just on a, a relative percentage uh, uh, cost basis, um, you know, without quoting a number per se, but just as a percentage, what, what percent of the central station cost are we talking about for this ladder truck? It would be, um, if we were trying to replace the ladder truck that we have out here right now, you'd probably be looking somewhere in 1.2 million. The one that we're looking at up here is right around 850,000. So, yeah. doing the math in my head and being wrong. <laughs> the, those are the numbers we're looking at, though. And um, if if it's all right, uh, 
Mayor Pro Tem, can I ask my ambulance questions? Certainly. Okay. Um, can you, um, other than years, what is the basis for the ambulance replacements and ambulance revenues have been down um, since we began in terms of what we had hoped for? They're not far off, but they are off. Um, is there any way to stretch out our replacement timing? So I think we had talked about trying to do a five-year replacement cycle. Um, and, and I think that because we're so early in um, that five-year cycle, understanding that we need to, um, we may need to stretch that out, or we may need to, if we, we don't have the revenue this year, but we have a better couple of years, we may be able to offset that and kind of get back on our track. So, you know, understanding that we may not have all the money that we want to put in this year towards that you know, that five-year cycle, uh, but we're so early into, I think we can still kind of play around with it and, you know, make decisions as we go over the next couple of years. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, if I, it's all right, I'd ask one more area sure. question. Sure, go ahead, Councilor Littman. <clears throat> um, in terms of the staffing this year, um, did we, um, we did we receive the grant, the safer type grant, um, and is that built into this budget? There's nothing built into it. We're still waiting. Um, well, we still have not heard. Um, we're hoping within the next month to hear, but um, it hasn't been finalized even to when they're going to send it out yet. The awards are so, not. How would it affect the numbers that we're looking at today? Um, so the staffing that we have now would be at nine. Um, most of the time, and the tenth would be uh, that would give us a tenth person per shift. The, the extra, I guess the extra. just financially, I guess I'm trying to. So, is the dollar value we see under staffing um, increasing if that we get that grant? The grant also includes everything financially that we have to do with, with the, uh, including overtime that they would cover. Uh, we estimated all, any, anything that they could have to do dollar figure wise. There was a couple things that didn't let us do this year, like gear replacement and stuff like that. Small dollar figures that I can certainly find in my budget, but from the salary side of it, um, it allowed it. We, we estimated overtime. We estimated health insurance costs. We estimated all those pieces that are uh, a financial number. So should not see any um, need for change based on that grant. We, we should have factored it all in. And is there a um, like savings plan that we had like developed for the last safer one? Uh, we, the city manager and I haven't even had a chance to talk about that too much yet. I know uh, on the last one that was very successful. We certainly would be looking to do that, that same um, process. Uh, but we haven't even had a chance to have that conversation yet. Thank you, Chief. I don't have any other questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lutman. Is anyone else? Right. Okay, Chief. I don't see that anyone else is, has any other questions. So uh, on behalf of the mayor, I'd like to thank you. This is a very good presentation. Thank you, sir. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, I apologize to the councilor. Uh, the mayor had to step out, so I'm kind of pinch hitting. So, okay. City manager, I guess, I don't know if the council wants to take a break for a minute or would like to continue. Uh, we can certainly do either. If, if the council wants a few minute break after the airport meeting and this, we can do that. And if you're ready to go, then we have um, parks, recreation and facilities in the queue to go for you. Okay. Um, no one seems to have uh, wanted to take a break. So go ahead, uh, city manager, and let's proceed. All right. We have Amy Luisek, director, and Matt Manser, assistant director, and We'll turn it over to whoever's taking the lead on it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's nice to see you all, sort of. I wish we were in person, and I'm sure next year we will be. Um, but 
this evening we're, we're going to go over a couple of different things. We're going to go over what we did well, what we um, what we're seeing in the future, and pretty much how we compare to other parks and rec facilities throughout the actually throughout the country. Um, I'm actually going to let Matt take over for the evening. Um, I am here if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free and ask, but he has the PowerPoint presentation and he will go from here. Hi guys, I will uh, share my screen here. All right, so um, we'll jump right in. Amy kind of, uh, she mentioned we're gonna talk about what went well this year, uh, how we compare to some other places and um, then what we're looking for for next year. So we'll jump right in, what went well. Um, this was really nothing, right? Like COVID was a tough year, um, but we, we uh, drove through pretty strong. Um, as some of you may know, some of you may not, uh, our youth sports, we don't run our youth sports through this office here. Instead, uh, uh, some nonprofits run uh, the youth sports in the area. So our job is to make sure the fields are good and really set those nonprofits up for success. Um, and, that was our goal this year, right? So through the fall, we were able to maintain quality fields for our for our youth sports to uh, use. Um, the spring was a bit of a squeeze. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but there was a very rapid like warming. Spring came very quick, um, and like at the same time, COVID limit uh, COVID restrictions were lifted, so there was just all of a sudden huge uh, demand for the use of the fields, um, and it was it was tough, challenging, but we were able to, um, to get through that pretty successfully and get them open uh, around the city. And we we're pretty excited about that. Um, programs that ran well, that ran throughout the course of the year, uh, pickleball, line dancing, rentals. Uh, the rentals were for park houses in the area, but then also here at the community center, we we're able to provide those, that program, um, those programs. And, um, Pickleball is a big one because there, there's a huge demand for pickleball in our area here. So um, we're very happy to, to be able to provide that. In terms of special events, um, we were able to, as COVID restrictions changed and altered, we were able to, to host things as we could. Um, the Halloween trick-or-treat at Opeachy was a, a huge event and um, we we're really happy to get that out. To, to get that feedback there. Um, over the course of last summer, uh, Governor Sununu talked about the, the tube of toothpaste scenario where if Massachusetts was closed, everything would be kind of forced up um, into New Hampshire here. And we did see that happen um, here along the, the coast here of New Hampshire. There were beaches that were closed all over the place. Um, if you remember about a year ago this time, we, we said, hey, we're going to be open. And that tube of toothpaste just dumped right here in Laconia. Um, it certainly wasn't easy, but it was, uh, we were able to use our, our kind of infrastructure to, uh, to take on a, a large group of tourists that were coming to the area. Um, elsewhere in the state, there were struggles. Uh, the Mount Washington Valley ran a... Uh, mind your manners campaign that they had to invest into uh, the pvc world news reported that new hampshire towns were uh were turning people away i don't remember that happening but um it, it was a struggle for a lot of places uh we had our internal struggles but we were able to to with, withstand it and, and um welcome those tourists and so that's another thing that we're we're, we're proud of from last year Another thing we're proud of is the skate park that uh, that came in recently. Um, it's an awesome skate park. If you guys haven't grabbed your scooters or your skateboards yet to go go do your kick flips, uh, I recommend it. <laughs> Not that I have, but uh, we have received a ton of praise from uh, those who have used it. We've seen daily use on it. Uh, we've seen people shovel it off over the winter just so that they can use it. And a nonprofit has already been uh, established to, to work on lighting and um, landscaping the area. So, so that was a big, um, a big win for us also. 
Uh, so on top of these areas, we also renovated the uh, Weir's Beach bathhouse. Uh, we completely renovated Bond Beach. Um, now there's handicap accessibility through the beach itself. So um, if you haven't had a chance to go check that out, please do. Let's see, Cheryl. This is, uh, I've got 10% of the battery left. It's a, a very cool spot down there at Bond Beach. Uh, we've also been continuing to restore our playgrounds, uh, get ADA accessibility throughout the, the, the city where we're able to. And um, we're currently working on uh, getting a new department header package for uh, Laconia Parks and Rec so that um, we can take advantage of some of the website features for our tourists and our, our and our residents to um, navigate our, our website a little more easily. Um, so now we'll go into kind of how we compare uh, the National Recreation Parks uh, Association recently came out with a study that shows the the median on a, a, a number of areas. So it's not the average because averages can be skewed with outliers. It's, it's the median. Um, so the equal number of data points or data sets are on either side of, of the median there. Um, this just came out a couple of weeks ago. So it was really interesting for us to, uh, to share um, what was coming out here. Um, Sorry, uh, sorry, I just had somebody step in here. I think it's Joyce Janitorial. Um, so let's see where we stack up. Um, so right off the bat, Chuck Norris is letting us know that uh, we are, are delivering STEM programming, um, which is fantastic. Uh, we have 2,060 residents per playground, which is way better than the national median of 3,600, um, you know, less, Less residents per playground means more playground for re for residents, right? So that's yeah. that's a big win right there. Residents per park, we're almost we almost have three times as many parks than um, than the national median here. So this is a huge win for us. But it's really interesting because we are right there close to the median uh, in terms of acres of parkland per thousand residents. So what this tells us is that we have a lot of parks, uh, but they're small uh, or smaller, right? Um, all right, so now let's, we'll start to, we'll, we'll look on the other side of this, um, operating expenditures per capita at 88, uh, $88.30. We come in at, uh, fiscal year 21, $48.83. Um, and this is the median for parks and rec agencies across the country, uh, the NRPA also broke it down by jurisdiction population. So if you look at our jurisdiction population, which is less than 20, uh, less than 20,000, our median is actually a little bit, a little bit more gnarly than that. Um, 114 would be the median. If you look at the lower quartile, that's 64. We're around two thirds of the lower quartile uh, in this area. I'd also like to point out the upper quartile here because an argument could be made, and I'll try to make it later on, that that should be what we're aiming for. Um, this obviously manifests itself in full-time equivalents. Um, a full-time equivalent is a year-round uh, staff member who's got 40 hours a week. Um, so 40 hours a week for 52 weeks is one full-time equivalent. Um, if you had two part-time staff, doing 20 hours a week for 52 weeks, that would be uh, also one full-time equivalent, right? So uh, per 10,000 residents, we're looking at 4.85, which is um, right there in line with, uh, with our operating expenditures. Um, and then let's look at our revenue to operating expenditures. In FY19, we were um, still low. Uh, but then you can see how COVID really kind of devastated this number. Um, it is important to note, and I'll go back to the youth sports, that is a large revenue generator for most parks and rec agencies. And that's not an area that we are generating a lot of revenue. We're getting some user fees there, but um, for the most part, our revenue is, is through parking. So, um, we, instead of just using numbers on a PowerPoint, we wanted to see like, all right, what, 
what are we missing out on by having this low of an operating expenditure per capita? And right off the bat, it looks at full-time equivalents here. Um, and this, this is staff to continue maintaining our fields. We are stretching our staff quite thin, our full-time year-round staff and our seasonal staff quite thin in maintaining our fields. Um, we're looking at um, community center staff to work the welcome desk uh, to be open evenings and weekends. You know, that's that's a, a, an additional way for us to uh, generate revenue and also provide more space and programming to the community. Um, looking at lifeguards at Weir's Beach, you know, um, this is a question that comes up a lot and I could go on for hours talking about it. Um, but this, this picture right here is from the Burlington Parks and Recreation uh, uh, website. And they've got 16 lifeguards here. Um, the North Beach at Burlington is probably one of, it, it is the only municipal lake beach in the Northeast that I can find um, that compares to the, the amount of patrons that we see at Weir's Beach. Uh, I've got a good connection with um, their beach supervisor over there. Um, he shared with me their, their uh, lifeguard manual and they've got a small army of lifeguards over there. It's, it's not something that we can look to replicate with, you know, three or four guards. This is, this is something that is going to have to uh, take a lot of inertia to kind of build and make happen. Um, we need to go from the rope buoys to the uh, to the the cable buoys again this year. There are too many times where patrons will hang on our ropes and snap them, and then the rope will will uh, <laughs> cantilever kind of out into the channel, and then we've got to go get it. Um, and we've got a watermark gave us a quote for six thousand, but um, you know that's that's too much for us right now. So. So, so if anybody wants to come help me out in a couple of weeks to uh, put some cables out there, I, I'm going to bring a wrench and a, and a wetsuit and um, we're going to go on after it. So if anyone's free, let me know. Um, security cameras. We've seen an increase in vandalism and graffiti uh, just in the last few months. Um, here is a photo from Laconia's talking where somebody's saying um, they must have security footage on here. We don't. Um, this buying and, and installing security cameras, that would have to be a CIP issue, uh, CIP project, but then the upkeep of those security cameras this is a really rough estimate on here. Um, but that's something that would need to come out of our operating expenses. Um, software, Parks and Rec software. This is something I've been talking to Nick and IT for a long time. How can we um, <laughs> get into the 21st century? We're still using paper uh, registrations and paper scheduling. Um, and still unable to take online payments. Um, these are areas that we could look to, to move forward. And then I'd say the biggest one that we'd want to do is, is outsource our public, uh, public restroom cleanings. Uh, currently, what we're doing right now is we're hiring for our full-time year-round uh, facility staff, we're hiring uh, turf management professionals uh, and, and um, kind of master of all trades because they're also doing facilities work. They're also uh, taking care of fields here, but then we, we send them every day for a good portion of their days to go clean bathrooms. Um, and not only are we not using them to their full potential, but we're also missing out on qualified candidates for those positions because of this job. I've had numerous people ask, hey, are we cleaning public bathrooms also? If so, withdraw my application i'm not interested so just right off the bat um we've got a uh, these are just these are these are kind of your more tangible things um that we just wanted to share uh at the moment here and the list continues to grow um and here's where I want to go into my argument about the upper quartile, right? Uh, because not only are we, do we have twice the parks with half the staff, but we also are doing facilities, which most parks and recreation agencies are not doing. Um, and we also have one of the largest municipal attractions in the Northeast uh, that we're responsible for. Um, 
And we also have, you know, the snowboards and the, the owners of vacation homes who come in here who might not be represented in that per capita number. Uh, so all things to be considered, uh, to, to consider, especially when looking at kind of where we compare. Uh, so hard numbers here. This is where F1, FY21 number was. If we were to go to the national median, that's what it would look like there. If we were to look at the median for jurisdictions of less than 20,000, we'd be looking at an increase of almost a million dollars. And if we were to look at the upper quartile, because we're also doing facilities and, and uh, Rose Beach here, we've got that astronomical number there. Now we know that this cannot be corrected overnight. This is gonna be a long-term um, project. This is, this is something that we need to work closely with you uh, on to how, to how we can intentionally and, and uh, effectively increase this operational budget over the next few years. But in the meantime, while we're working on that, all we're asking for this year is an increase in 40,000 in our maintenance grounds line. And this is directly for our fields. The, uh, the, uh, we take a lot of pride in these fields. A uh, number of our stakeholders uh, consistently share their pride in these fields here. Governor Sununu over uh, on the Little League uh, opening day mentioned how great the fields were. Um, this is my favorite one right here. Uh, my mom's my mom's doctor told her how wonderful the fields are. She didn't have to say that. She could use any number of small talk, but but she came out and said, "Those fields are wonderful. Thank thank your son." Uh, and I had to pass that on to our team um, because the fields are wonderful. Now this increase of um, forty thousand is going to go towards the the presence of clover and other weeds that we. Um, that we know exists there. We want to take care of them now before they get more, before they grow, expand, get worse. So we'll use um, pesticides to take care of those this summer. Um, and this will be the first time we've used pesticides on these fields in, in um, almost 10 years, which is a uh, nice little, you know, pat on the back kind of thing, I think, especially being the city and the lakes. Um, but then along with this, other strategies to get rid of the, the weeds will be used like uh, adding more compost, overseeding, um, and then just maintaining it with equipment. So all, all these things come with additional uh, costs, which comes the, the, the 40,000 here. This line also covers graffiti removal and vandalism, um, just so that we can keep consistent with that as well. Um, thank you, thank you for, uh, watching the presentation and, and um, we're definitely open for any questions. Um, you know, I, I would love to leave us with the thought that, you know, what we invest in is what we value and being the city on the lakes, this is a lot of people um, value our fields and our recreation and um, our trails and, and what, what the city naturally provides. Um, we're hoping that over the next five years we can figure out how to, how to value that aspect uh, more intentionally here. So please, um, any questions now, but then also please feel free to reach out at any point, whenever, uh, we'd love to chat more about Park Parks. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, Councilor Lippman. I'll let another council go first if they'd like, but I'd like to ask a question when time comes. I think you're on. Um, thank you for the presentation. I um, was wondering, the WOW Trail um, had, has a association that were fundraising activities to fund a, a trust to help support the, the WOW Trail. Where, where is or is that reflected in your budget? It actually is not reflected in our budget. What we do is we put in a, um, basically an invoice to the city itself, um, letting them know how much man, how many man hours we have actually worked there, who it was, how much they get paid per hour, and they reimburse us in the salary line for that. 
Um, if we have any real maintenance, you know, repairs or fencing, that type of thing, it comes out of that specific account, not, not parts budget. Uh, and maybe this is questions for Glenn um, or the manager, just in terms of the accounting, just trying to follow how that flows through um, to our overall budget. I can step in on that. The, um, the WOW funds are segregated into their own accounts within our grants, but overall grants budget. And then as we receive invoices, those are, it's paid out of those funds. And do they offset the numbers that are in the budget here or, or your, your budget numbers reflect that you're going to get offsets coming in from the, the trust segregated funds? Uh, most of what happens with the WOW funds are um, individual studies or paying particular vendors. Um, so anything that would go uh, to the city would, uh, the revenue would come from those grant funds and flow into the general fund into the parks budget. I guess that's what I would thought. I'm just, in terms of tracing what they're, what's being contributed there. I just be interested in knowing that. We can pull that information. What's planned. Um, second question. I know we've invested in some um, better equipment over the last couple of years. And, you know, um, I think the fields generally are excellent. Um, but, you know, like down at Opeachy Park this past year, we had sort of the infields um, on the, not the, the main major league park, but a lot of the overgrowth of the field to, to into the into the dirt areas. And just curious in terms of whether the equipment that we got will help us uh, better maintain that. So we don't have a specific piece of equipment that does that. We do drag those fields um, and that tends to bring up some of the weeds, but mostly that's a hand, hand hand tool type of a thing. Um, we go out there with, with rakes and things like that. Um, we don't have a piece of equipment for that yet. Is there a piece of equipment that is a, could be available? Because that, that really makes the, the fields look pretty bad when, when it's kind of growing up in between things. I'm sure there is, and I will look into it. Um, it's okay. Um, Go ahead, Councilor Okay. Um, and uh, in terms of the, the beaches and particularly the, I think it's um, the beach on the, that's uh, closest to uh, uh, the Belmont line there that where there's been some nice work done to reclaim that beach. It's kind of had a rough winter. Is there any specific plan to sort of reclaim that to get that up to a, a good standard again. Absolutely, uh, it it gets this every year. For some reason, that beach, all that churning water goes. Everything's brought right up to it. Um, it's been cleaned twice. You know, it doesn't look like it, but that's how much the water moves and brings stuff in. So this is what our spring looks like there. Um, so it will be cleaned again, obviously, um, as many times as it takes to make the, the facility look nice. Um, in addition to that, I understand that there are some ruts in the parking lot, um, dirt parking lot, it happens, but the DPW has been asked to help us out with creating that. Yeah. The turf, the turf's a little, a little rough too from the winter. Thank you. Um, I don't have any other questions, but thank you for the work you do on the, we're really lucky to have the, it's really one of our, uh, assets, all the parks and the, the quality of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Littman. Anyone else? Councilor Hamill? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, first, I just want to thank the Parks and Rec crew, Amy and Matt, and everybody that works there. Uh, they work their butts off with uh, low personnel, and they do a great job. Um, <clears throat> Amy and I and, and Matt had some meetings here not long ago and to address some of the concerns and uh, that's been achieved, I believe. <clears throat> but also in the budget, I was noticing, and Scott, uh, if I'm wrong, correct me, please. But uh, under the uh, maintenance and grounds, that's been increased 70,000. Would that go towards the 
herbicides and fertilizers and all that uh, material that we were looking to do, Scott? Yeah, so actually we kind of did a two-pronged approach, counsel approach, counselor, and part of it was, um, as was highlighted with COVID, we, we didn't have lifeguards, we didn't have certain um, other seasonal positions. We did have beach ambassadors um, this past year to help maintain some water around the beach and, and um, try to keep them in a good operating condition. So those particular uh, positions were reimbursable through us. Uh, to us through uh, COVID funds because they were not originally budgeted for. What we did to get a jump start on some of the fields of the pre-emergent and the pesticide uh, treatments, the herbicide treatments now, was to repurpose some of those temporary dollars that we were unable to spend during this fiscal year that were winding down at the end of June to get that jump. And then what you're seeing built into the budget hopefully carries us through the remainder of the the calendar season, if you will, through fall and to start next year. And then next year's budget, we will have to plug a little bit more in with some of the shifting of the dollars because we certainly want to be hiring lifeguards and, and having other temporary positions within our parks and recreation. So um, we, we took the lemons that COVID handed us and made the best we could this year to jumpstart the fields, which we knew was a priority for the council and phase some money and there'll be a little bit more money that needs to be phased in to put the just the field maintenance on the full cycle that um, that you, you were in those meetings on. Okay, great. <clears throat> and um, we'll be looking uh, maybe in the future, if the uh, budget allows that we'll maintain that uh, 40,000 to uh, provide the necessary materials for the fields. Absolutely. Once we build it in, it's my intent to keep it there. And then, like I say, add the next component to it so we have a full year's cycle without having to rob from a temporary salaries line item, which we had the luxury, I'll call it a luxury, to do this year for unfortunate reasons, obviously. But we, we made best use of those funds to jumpstart something that we couldn't do otherwise. Okay. <clears throat> uh, also, uh, as far as manpower goes, is we've increased police and, you know, we're looking to increase fire and... Uh, some of the other areas. It says some way that we can uh, look at maybe uh, doing a half year uh, for somebody, you know, to end up being full time on Pox and Rec. Uh, if not, uh, obviously, I don't think we can do it at the beginning of this year, but maybe towards the fall or early spring next year. Uh, could we look into uh, adding another full time person there? <clears throat> We've got money in there to hire those people. It's just the challenge in finding the people who are. You want to be in the job market and, and come perform this work. We bumped up salaries for our seasonal mm -hmm. maintenance workers. We bumped up salaries for lifeguards uh, to be more competitive. Um, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong. I know we reclassified a job position in the last year or two because that particular position was more of the jack of all trades and doing some you know light electrical work and light plumbing work and those types of things. And we didn't want to... Um, lose that employee, we invested time. And as, as Matt pointed out, a lot of these folks are turf professionals. This one in particular, when you know, we sent them to an organic turf maintenance program in Maine a couple of years ago, I believe it was Maine. Um, so anyhow, we, we, we want to put the folks who have these skills to work in the field, which they wanna do, not necessarily doing mundane, boring stuff. Um, but right now it, it's, I mean, if you looked at the help wanted ads in the paper and online, everybody is screaming for help and that's who we're competing against. So we've got dollars there ready to hire the right people tomorrow. Um, we just have to find those right people who want to walk in our door. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> uh, Matt, what was the uh, the buoys you were calling out at the, the weirs? Uh, what, what did you call those, the new ones you wanted? Um, they're... I cannot remember what I called them. I think I just called them big old orange buoys. Uh, <laughs> they they were they're actually the old buoys um, that were used a number of years ago, and um, we've had them up at the state school property for a while. And so we're going to bring those back. So we're in the process of finding the right kind of cable. Uh, the cable that was last used was uh, it deteriorated deteriorated in the water just way too fast so now we're really trying to find the right kind of cable to uh to use the string out there and um and, and yeah put those back out there but it's, but it's not the preferred buoys that you're looking to put there is that correct or uh they, they are the preferred buoys okay. they're great i i'm looking for somebody who knows what they're doing to to do it right so i'll be i'll be out there in a couple of weeks um kind of fumbling through it i have a plan i think it's gonna work but 
haven't, this is, this is a new, new kind of area for me. So, um, okay. Cause you mentioned something about the $6,000 cost. What yeah. So, uh, Watermark gave us a, a quote for $6,000 for the, um, for the cable, um, and to go out there and set up those buoys themselves, uh, how, however they, they go about doing it. So, um, we thought, we thought the quote was, was pretty darn high and, and I said, I think I can do it. So, um, that's, that's kind of where we're at and that's what we're going to uh, swing the bat on this year. Um, so, so when are you going, when are you looking to do this? Uh, as soon as it gets warm enough that I can be in the water for an extended period of time, but before Memorial day. So sometime in the next two weeks. Okay. <clears throat> what I was thinking, uh, Scott, if it's, if it's possible and, and they don't have the funds to, to get the cable or whatever, uh, we still got the capital reserve fund. Uh, and I think it would be important for them to get the proper, uh, equipment out there for, for the buoys? I think we can line up the proper cable. And I think the, the installation was probably what Matt and Amy were looking at and saying, okay, if we get the right cable, let's uh, go out and be creative and install the swim lines ourselves rather than paying, you know, a, a company to mobilize with whatever. Um, but um, again, I think this is what our staff does, not only in, in parks, rec and facilities, but across the city are creative and try to stretch our dollars to, go further in, can we do this ourselves and invest those dollars we're going to save in some, in some other program that's going to pay more dividends. Yeah, no doubt. And they do a good job at it. So thank yes, you. Do. Thank you, uh, Amy and Matt and your, your crew for a great job again this year. Yeah. Thank you very much. For a, for, a minute, for a minute there, Councillor Hamill, you have me worried. I thought you were going to volunteer to go out and uh, be in the water. <laughs> I was excited. It was going to be like uh, Christmas village. But <laughs> I was going to say, let me call yeah. Primex first and see if we can get a rider on that. Yeah, you probably need one too. Colonial <laughs> Theater Entertainment. I, I, I look really great in a Speedo, but I don't know. <laughs> Council of Cheney. Uh, Amy and Matt, I have a comment and a question. My comment is that uh, the State Park exceeded uh, my hope and uh, and I hope you get some consideration to expanding it going forward. Um, I think it's a raging success. I go by there at night, there are people with their headlights on to help their kids uh, keep going. They, they range in age from toddler to middle age. And I just I think it's a spectacular improvement. And again, I, I hope you give some consideration to the possibility of uh, enlarging it because uh, I think the number of kids is, is growing. My, uh, my question is, and I know this will come as a shock to you, Amy, how are we doing with Pickford Farm? I, I, I'm having trouble hearing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How are we doing with pickerel pond? Uh, pearly pond? Do you mean the pearly? I'm sorry, pearly <laughs> pond, yes. Okay. Um, so we had a conversation with uh, my department, worked with the Conservation Commission, and came up with a pseudo maintenance plan, which was asked for from them. Um, you remember last year it got very dry and we got a little overzealous with our mowing. Um, and got into the wetland areas. So what they're going to do is they're going to delineate the, the, um, the actual wetland for us with some stakes. Uh, and we will not go past those stakes, no matter if it's bone dry or not, we, we don't go past that. Um, they have a couple of plantings that they are getting ready to put in. Um, they're starting with the blue irises uh, to add a little color over there. Um, but we, we are being given a, literally a, a stopping point um, and we are not to go go past that area so that's where we are on my end are they going to allow you to keep the level of, of the vegetation down sufficiently that you can see the pond so i think that that's what they discussed with the des is that correct scott yeah, so I think the plan was to have some vistas in there. And as you recall, Councilor Cheney, you were at the meeting that we had this conversation with them. We, we actually kind of tasked the Conservation Commission to work with their staff to come up with an approach that 
would meet the needs of DES Conservation Commission and the council for, for having an attractive pond. So this, this maintenance and light plantings of not having tall um, growth items, um, you know, putting in native species that are gonna, gonna thrive there is what we're going for this year. We did get our permit approval with DES that is good for up to five years to go in and do a dredge if we need to. Um, so we've got that in our back pocket rather than go out to bid and probably incur a 30 or 40 or $50,000 mobilization and dredge and do some things there immediately out of the gate. We thought, well, why not go the less expensive, um, you know, do it yourself kind of this year, getting all parties together on the same page. And if we like the results, great, we can maintain it. And if we think this more still needs to be done um, to do the dredge to kind of add some, uh, add some life to the pond, if you will, we've got up to five years with that permit that has already been approved and paid for. I, I, I hope someone takes a moment to uh, check the pond for debris uh, sometime in the near future. I know it's rather high at the moment, but uh, there is debris in the pond and it would be nice if we could clean some of that out as well. Uh, that, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Councilor. If I may, um, the CONCOM, when they mentioned to us, you know, delineating the area, they did not want us going into or near the reeds that are there. Um, we have been asked by them to stay clear of the actual pond itself. I just wanted to reiterate that we are on the grass side, um, according to them. But they did ask me for the deed for the, the property to see what the, what the family had asked for originally. Um, and so I have since given that to them and they are looking at that to see what, what else they can do. I, I doubt seriously they want to leave garbage in the pond. Oh, no, no, I, I was talking about the reeds. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Not the garbage. Okay. No, I, I hope we can do something about the reeds somehow so that because they, they block the view of the pond. I understand you have them to deal with and let's see what I can do about them. Uh, I, I like the idea of plantings of some native plants, but I hope they were lower and deep access, visual access to the pond. They, they will not impede the visual access. Absolutely not. They are 18 to 24 inches tops. Anyone else? Council Felch. Yes. Uh, I want to thank Amy and Matt and your crew for everything you do. Um, I know you do a lot with a little. And I, I as well would like to see your budget increase when we can. Um, I also wonder maybe the fire department could help you with those buoys, Matt? We did actually consider it. They did help us at one point when we had to refloat the, the, the anchors. They helped us at one point. So something to check into, but thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Susie, do you have any question? Okay. Um, Amy, Matt, thank you for the presentation. Um, I found it very interesting to compare where we were as far as dollars and cents and park capacity and that stuff. And I think uh, from this councilor's standpoint, I think that'll bode you well because uh, I agree with Councilor Hamill. I think we start to need to look at the situation as far as uh, help is concerned. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, at this point in time, uh, City Manager Myers, I think we'd like to take five minutes if that's possible, and then we'll return to Public Works. You have the gavel, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, so five minutes it is. Okay, it's 821. If everybody Thanks. will mute if you aren't muted. Thanks, guys.
I don't know how the parks department does what they do with so little money. Yeah, I know. Compared to what I see the other budgets, this is the one that I think is the most underfunded at all. Well, and I think it has been for a number of years. And I think, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to address that sooner than later. Maintaining all the buildings and doing everything else like that. And well, you know, I was wondering, and this is something we could chat about later. I'm just wondering if um, the answer to their problem is um, separating out facilities and um, and then just taking some of that other stuff as far as building maintenance and some of the aspects that they have to deal with and just outsource it. You know, like cleaning of the bathrooms in the summertime. Yeah, I think you could outsource that. I mean, it's going to cost more money. Yeah, I understand, but these what they do is so visible to the rest of the, of the visitors and the public we have. Okay. Yep. It's so visible, and everything they do. I mean, take the Halloween thing. Who thought it'd be such a tremendous success? Okay. I mean, yeah. and lots of stuff they do is not planned. It's spur of the moment. Oh, something came up. Let's do something. Okay. You know, it's, it's hard. Well, in, you know, I worked in a situation where just out of college where uh, the parks and recreation were just recreation. The, yeah. uh, the uh, f facilities, the uh, playgrounds were all maintained by the public works department, you know, as a separate department of buildings and grounds department. I mean, we put so much on that group, with so little people, so much little money. I mean, we've got numerous parks. And, you know, you look at the list that they take care of and, you know, just. Well, you know, one of the things is, and I haven't pushed the issue, but I, I did mention it last year that some of the small areas that they maintain, I'll give you like, for instance, the police department and the fire station, yeah. those could be outsourced. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you guys because they also do cemeteries. They do all the trails. Yeah, that's, I mean, they, they do so much for so they, little. They, they, they get, they, they operate under, I wish some of the other departments would have the same fiscal responsibility. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, put it mildly, let's put it that way. Okay. okay. And then we're gonna find a way to help them one thing she mentioned, we're gonna find a way to help them so they can collect the money. They have no way of, of uh, you know, they, they can't take uh, credit cards, I guess, I think for some, if they wanna raise some funds or there's some places they charge dollars, you know? I'd like to know, and then maybe I just, where does all the parking meter money go? Mr. Deputy Mayor or Mayor Pro Tem, I'm just thinking <laughs> now you've, pull back and you got a quorum of people here and you haven't called the meeting back to order yet. And yes, I'm going to, you guys are still live and all being recorded. So I just want to kind of, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, as far as the council's concerned, it's 828. We had a five minute recess. We have uh, exceeded that by two minutes. So I hereby call the meeting back to order. Uh, City manager Marius, I guess the next step is public works. We do, we have Public Works Director Wes Anderson with us to go over Public Works. Uh, solid waste probably at a higher level because I know the committee is working uh, on that. And as you mentioned, uh, um, Mayor Pro Tem, that that's gonna be a couple of meeting process and then also mm -hmm. sanitary sewer. Okay, so let's see if I can get the share screen up. Can you see my screen? No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let me see what's going on here. Okay. No pressure, Wes. The other two departments got their screen shared. There it is. Let's see. No, not yet. <laughs> All right. Right. Hey, I was working it hard. I thought I had an even practiced. Wes, why don't you turn Wes, turn your video on and that may help you share your screen. I think I have it on. 
We're not seeing you either. <laughs> well, you're a little green box with a white circle. Uh, I have no idea. Because I'm in front of the camera and the camera's turned on. Glenn, do you have the ability, do you have Wes's presentation? Can you share his document on your screen? I have a PDF of his, um, of his presentation. It'll take a minute to load it into this computer. We could do that if you wish, uh, Wes and Scott. Yeah, we may have to. I don't know why we're not showing it. Everything's turned on. And I saw you on video when you first joined, but I don't see your video at the moment. Sometimes dropping yeah, out. There you, you are. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Now we try it. Can you see that one? I can see you now. Okay. So I got to get it shared. Let me go back to this. Share screen. PowerPoint. Share. Hey. There you go. Wow. Now you have the button at the bottom right there. Okay, so let me go slideshow. There we go. Okay, sorry. Okay, Wes. Technically challenged at times. <laughs> okay, so tonight's presentation, and I'll go through it fairly quickly and then can ask questions. Uh, it's the typical, we'll cover the general funds capital internal service fund, and then hit projects at the end. Okay, from the solid waste standpoint, high level, it's still, the FIFA is still for recycling. It's quality, not quantity. And we've got some upcoming changes that impact us in about a year. And of course, the Public Works Committee is working on it to figure out how to control costs. But the reason why I'm showing this because for the upcoming fiscal year, when I built the budget, it looked like we're going to have an increase of 161,000. Uh, with the recent approval and acceptance of the contract extension that begins on October 1st this year, that's going to be increasing by another 15,000 for this year. So solid waste is taking more and more of the city's funds uh, to accomplish what we're doing. Just to show you our, where we were and where we are on our solid waste, the blue is of course the solid waste itself. And we increased by about 2,000 tons. Now in this particular year, this is the first year where we had uh, Guilford coming to us. So most of that is associated with Guilford and the rest of course is COVID. And you can see where we are in recycling. It was 816 tons per year. Just to give you an idea of what's happened with recycling. Uh, at one point uh, last year, we were up to over $130 a ton we were paying to process our recycling. The market has since recovered. And in the last couple of months, we've been paying underneath $60 a ton. The one change you've got to remember on for that is with the one October uh, change to it, our cost of processing goes from 108, let me go back to the previous, goes from $108 a ton to $137 a ton. So that 52 to, to 11, if we constantly get uh, our revenue for it will just increase by almost $30. It'll be around $80 a ton that we'll be paying after October. Okay, so general fund overview. Most of my uh, changes and increases associated with either salaries or ISF repair and replacement because trucks are expensive and people are expensive. Uh, a little bit increase in winter maintenance but most of it's highway maintenance and streetlights. Uh, what we're looking at seeing what we can do still to change our highway maintenance and our winter maintenance procedures to save funds that we can use in other aspects of public works. Again, retroactivity and getting our signs changed out is key as well as 
keeping our uh, traffic signal maintenance up and our striping. What you've got a sort of flavor of with the email in regards to being able to get paint right now is we are not even getting good news back from our long line striping company. He has not gotten any of his paint for the year. So we're looking at what we need to do in the interim to get us through this summer and into next winter with having some form of striping out there in case he does not get paint. Uh, we also do tree removal and we're in the process of working or maintaining three of the old landfills in the city. Uh, so far, we've been lucky. PFAS has not become an issue. All of our test results are still negative for that. And we're much pleased with that. Where we are, again, in the general fund for the accept as is, I had uh, meetings with 14 streets. So of those 14, two looks like they want to stay private. We're working on five the documentation for the uh, city attorneys to be able to come back to city council to get those streets accepted. And I've got seven on the waiting list waiting for funds that becomes available on the 1st of July. On snow removal, we had a light uh, year this year for snow. Some of that money will be freed up to return back to the city. And we're still looking at what we can do to improve our snow removal system from the downtown and other areas in the city. And our work order system has been in use and it's helping us keep track of what work is out there and what work has been called into us. And we've been using it since September and we're still in the training mode, but we're coming quite along and adapting to it. Road improvements for construction season. This is the slide we show you every year. We're still hovering someplace around the nine uh, miles of road every year. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we're at 9.7. And just to give you a rough idea of what we did, uh, it was about 4. Point, it was about 0. 0.41 miles of reconstruction, uh, almost a mile of shim and overlay, and almost two miles of uh, maintenance shims that we did in the past. And that include Lafayette for the reclaim and overlay, uh, Beacon Street East, West, Veteran Square, Bell Street for shim and overlay, and then many maintenance shims that you've seen out there, North Street, uh, Lawrence, sections of White Oaks, and Edgewater. We're still uh, keeping track on what we've committed to in regards to improving the quality of our road construction or road maintenance. Uh, we're still doing soil testing compaction of our projects. We don't do it necessarily every day, but we do it enough to keep contractors honest and at critical times. We have uh, a city inspector on site, but that means one of my own personnel or one of our consultants, depending upon what is the scope of the project and what is the nature of the particular work. We're still following the objectives of the pavement management program. We're trying to keep good roads good. That includes crack sealing, and when you see some uh, proposals for the future coming up, and we're trying to maintain our condition rating for our roads and improve it. And then we are still working on keeping a five-year coordination plan with an additional five years conceptual plan of where we want to go with our roads. In the near term, Comcast is still out there. Uh, we're supporting them hot and heavy, trying to get all the their permits in and their poles in. Uh, they are at times out there actually removing poles, not as fast as I like, but they are doing it. On the ADA improvement at the traffic signal side, we have three done now. None are scheduled for this year. We have four remaining and two are associated when we do the Union Avenue project from uh, Main Street to Guilford Ave. The parking garage, we spent a little over 34,000 this year. And we still had to continue reinforcing the third deck uh, because it's starting to show signs that we've got to do that reinforcement to be able to carry the snow load. On the internal service fund standpoint, we maintain the city's vehicles and we keep track of it uh, for using that work order system that we've just implemented because it does both the fleet side and the, uh, the public work side of the house. Uh, it is funded by the other departments. We are watching carefully the cost impacts of us for fuel because price of fuel is going up. 
as well as the age of fleet and we're appropriate when necessary what we're buying is extended warranties just lower our initial cost and keep our costs down uh, short-term plan we're still focused on training our crews from the standpoint of uh, using the automated systems that are out there to be able to diagnose and improve the repair and maintenance of our vehicles and you'll see it later but i'm working with blend to be able to update our internal service fund procedures to make sure we will be able to get back into the black. Sanitary sewer fund side, uh, it's coming along quite well in regards to our, our work with the Winnipesaukee River Basin Program. Uh, they are 63% of our annual sewer budget. Uh, the rate system was established back in the 1980s. We're getting close, very close to having a new ballot rate allocation model. Uh, the proposal is going to be talked and uh, presented again to the advisory board in this week with an objective to have all of it approved by June of this year and will probably be implemented probably over a three or four year period. Uh, there are some major changes. We anticipate, based on what we've seen, we could have a $220,000 reduction and our cost to the Wabasaki River Basin program, but communities like Guilford, Tilton, and Meredith will see increases because of their population growth and their consumption of water. Again, uh, we in our sewer system, we have not found any PFAS, but they're finding the concentrations are up at the Winnipesaukee River Basin program, so they're no longer land applying it. It's having to go to one of the uh, sewage treatment plants at the coast that has the ability to incinerate it and they're burning the, uh, the, the sludge to be able to burn off the PFAS. That has raised the costs uh, to the department and to the city and we've included that in this budget. Uh, you can see what our plans are for construction on uh, in sanitary sewer fund. Uh, the rate increases in 19, 20 and 21 are getting ready to kick off or have kicked off. Uh, right now, they're working on the Mechanic Street sewer. The bid for the Elm Street sewer is out, and we should be getting bids back in uh, sometime in June with the project starting in June. Uh, so you can expect to see a lot of work done on Elm Street as well as Massachusetts and uh, Jefferson. Uh, and we're still working on the sanitary sewer ordinance. Uh, that is something that we, as well as many other communities in the basin, have to update. And one of the requirements for us, as well as all the other communities, to make sure that all the private systems are included in our annual reporting system uh, to EPA. And we're still looking at uh, getting a force main and septal line, intercept aligning program to make sure those elements of our system are kept up and will not provide uh, cause problems in the future. Where are we right now with the sanitary sewer fund itself? Uh, we're in the process of doing a rate model update. That's not necessarily a increase in fees. What we're trying to do too is determine are the revenues coming in what we expected and what is the impact of the yearly decline in water consumption? Now, does that mean we need to go more from a, from a water consumption based fee to a more of a fixed fee? On the project side, uh, you're going to be seeing the Elm Street project that we already discussed. That sewer line basically goes from School Street to Hickory Stick. We have not heard back yet for the grant for sidewalk and most of the used trail. That's probably an August to September time frame, which would be then in time for the actual road construction, which is scheduled for next construction season, not this construction season. On the annual side of the house, uh, We'll do, we're planning for next year for a microsurface on North Main Street uh, to be able to take away some of the, uh, the wear pattern that's starting to appear in regards to on the surface from all the heavy traffic, as well as doing Jefferson, Massachusetts, and Crescent, as, long, as well as Elm Street itself. Subject to your questions. Oh, thank you, Wes. Um, I have a question. Uh, are we on schedule still for the Durkee Brook project? We are right now. What, what, what it sits 
is we're waiting on for the portion for the water line and the drainage line. The sewer's already complete and done. We had a meeting with Kevin Morissette uh, last week, and it sounds like we'll be able to get an easement from uh, Peter in regards to the party store to run the water line above ground over the Turkey Brook right to between the budget gas and the party store. And we got in touch with the owner of the party, uh, owner of uh, the budget gas, and that looks like we'll have the easement for there. So once we get those documents done, we get the EPA permit, we'll be able to uh, actual program the actual construction of the, the water line and the, the uh, drainage. And this, uh, the actual closure of the, of the bridge site is still programmed for after Labor Day through Columbus Day. Okay, thank you, Wes. Councilors, any questions? Council Lippman. Yeah, this maybe Glenn or the manager could address the um, page uh, 169 of the budget, the internal services fund and the negative 25,000. Um, that. Let me start and then I'll have Glenn chime in on some of the specifics with that. Um, so as we've shared in the past, and I think you heard from our auditors that the, the ISF um, has been running uh, in the red really for probably about a dozen years now, if not more. And it's just, um, you know, billing out for the entire fleet for all purchases, maintenance, uh, mechanics, cost, fuel, as you heard Wes say, everything involved with our vehicles, and also including some of the smaller um, engines that are, are associated with parks and recreation and some of their functions all go through that. And, and the long and short of it is it's one, it's, uh, it's one checking account or one bank account within the city's umbrella that basically all departments contribute their fair share of, of vehicle maintenance, fleet maintenance into the ISF. So at the end of the day, it's made whole. Some communities also do this with things like office supplies. They have uh, they have stores, if you will, and people purchase their toner and their, their paper and their other office supplies through one central store within a community. Um, so it's been operating in, in, in the red and you've heard the auditor you know, bring it forward in this last audit that we've been to silo it. So we've spoken with the auditors um, it is, it, it can be a paper transaction to make that go away. Um, and it's basically, you know, having one arm of the city, you know, forgive uh, this overage to another, you know, another arm of the city, another checking account in the city. Um, but for right now, in the terms of the actuals for this year's budget, uh, and Glenn helped me out, we've, we've cut the shortfall, which was, I believe, over $100,000 down to only 25 with the intention of having it be at a break even scenario um, in next year's fiscal year. And um, while in some sense it is depreciation and what can be considered paper money, it is real money. And these costs do, um, they do show up in the various budgets and, and they are real hard costs in fuel and salaries and parts and vehicles and tires and all of those types of things. It's just something we bill out internally to try to have every department pay its fair share. Um, so Glenn, I probably messed a few things up, but jump in and, and okay. help me out. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, I, I just wanna reiterate what, what Scott said in that and, and the issues with the ISF, and I'll get this uh, into more detail on this when we do the finance budget. Uh, th there's two components to it. And one is, is looking backward, as Scott said, at the last 12 years and where the, things are going. And the second component is looking forward to see how we kind of fix the, um, what I call the structural imbalance um, on a moving forward basis. And, and the decision we, we made there was to uh, do that slowly because the imbalance does affect the general fund as you transfer monies from the general fund into the ISF. Um, and so right, right now what we're looking at is uh, bringing that structural imbalance down to about $100,000 from about $130,000. Now, speaking to the $25,000 that you uh, pointed to, uh, Councilor Lipman, um, in particular, it's um, the, the ISF for accounting purposes is, is two separate funds. We, uh, and, and we did that so we could better track how money flows back and forth with the two different uh, purposes the ISF ser serves. Um, one of those is vehicle repair, 
and the other is vehicle replacement, the capital uh, purchase of vehicles. Uh, from the, when we look at it um, from, from a fiscal point of view and actually from a legal point of view, those two funds are combined. And you'll see that on page 164 of the budget. They are um, fund 92 and 93. And what you see is a is a twenty four thousand dollar deficit in ninety three, and it's about a same um, uh, amount overage in ninety two. Uh, from the accounting of the auditing point of view, you add those two numbers together, and as we continue to move forward, we'll kind of balance that out so it looks better on the on the individual components of the of the ISF, um, and they will they'll. Um, you know, average out over time. So that, that's where we're standing for this year. And it is a, a multi-year process. Um, and we're, we're hope to make, a, as I call it, a soft landing in fixing this problem uh, over the next uh, probably three or four years. Follow up if I could. Yes, Councillor Lippman, go ahead. Um, so one of the things that we looked at historically and um, it's sort of like uh, um, weeding a garden is sometimes when we buy new equipment, we leave the old equipment around because we like to have a backup just in case. In some case, some cases that's probably appropriate. In other cases, it's just kind of too much comfort and expense added by maintaining and insuring equipment. When's the last time we did a, um, a, a comprehensive review of whether we have any equipment that we're holding on to and servicing that we really haven't really used or haven't served a purpose? Uh, that, that's more an operational question than a finance, finance question. What I can tell you is that um, every at the end of every fiscal year, we uh, send each department a list of, uh, of items on their fixed asset list and they identify what um, can, should be removed from the list, which uh, reach the end of its useful life, et cetera. And in terms of vehicles, those are disposed of on, a, on an annual basis. Um, yeah. Excuse me. I just, you know, I guess it's sort of like um, no, no um, criticism of the departments, but kind of like, you know, what's my I like, as opposed to having sort of an independent review of that. Um, you know, sort of an internal audit of, of what is being done there. I guess, you know, given that we have this deficit in the account, we're having to devote funds to it. I want to make sure that we're not um, carrying equipment and vehicles that we, we shouldn't be um, because that's basically taking away from money that we could otherwise have for other purposes. I think my general impression is that that is not happening, but again, I haven't really delved into it that that closely and uh, we can certainly do that. I guess maybe the, we could see the equipment that was bought in the last year versus that was taken out of service off the books. It'd be interesting to, to trace, track that for a number of years here, you know. I, I think we can work with John Gardner on that. John handles our purchasing, but every time we have something that goes to surplus, whether it's vehicles or whether it's it's other um, items that we're surplusing, those also go through through John and, and as Glenn said, through finance, so we're tracking the assets. So we can certainly run just a three-year report of what was purchased new and what was disposed of through auction. And there's a couple of platforms um, that we're able to use to dispose of things. So we, we can put something together and at least um, give you a sense of maybe a three-year snapshot if that works. Yeah, and I guess, you know, if we wanted to also address the deficit through some use of non-capital reserve to um, transfer to acquire something um, to take a little bit each year to help offset that. We could do that too, potentially, if the counselors were in agreement on that. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Glenn and I were talking that maybe once we get through the budget, we work with the finance committee because there may be a different approach um, just with our various fund balances. And again, as you know, right now, one, one of them is siloed where it's a non-spendable according to the auditors, but there may be more of a paper transaction that occurs um, that kind of cleans the slate, um, doesn't have anything to do with us exceeding the tax gap and gets us to a point where going forward operationally, you know, we target to be at a break-even scenario. So 
Um, rather than throw too much in the mix during the budget season, we think this is something that we could look to address in the coming weeks. And um, you know, on one hand, if we could find a way to fit it in before the end of June, which is the end of the fiscal year, I know Glenn has shared with me that that certainly has some benefits in terms of the audit um, for the year that will be ending. Um, so, so maybe we can do a, um, a, as, as chair of the finance committee, maybe we just do a three-way conversation and just kind of lay it out and see if it's something that we want to try to make happen pre-June 30th and we can lay out some scenarios for you. That'd be great. Thank you. And okay. it's, there's a lot going on. And so some of the stuff sometimes just, it just, there's a lot going on. <laughs> no, and I hear you in COVID and these types of meetings don't make it any easier to try to sit there and do a work session type of thing easier. Just it's clunky. Absolutely. I uh, appreciate the good work that's being done. Thank you. Thank you, Council Go ahead. Anyone else? Councilor Hamill. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to um, continue a little bit with what Henry said. Um, and um, what I'm curious is, could some of the deficit be that, um, you know, when we go through the budget and it's presented to us, uh, the different departments kind of say what equipment they're looking to buy, you know, whether it's three cruises, a lawnmower or, or you know, DPW truck or whatever. Uh, and then you kind of notice that the three cruises might be, and, and I'm not picking on them, but could be two cruises in a, in a van or a pickup truck, you know, something along that idea that once they get the money, it's kind of purchased what they want. And maybe those vehicles are a little more expensive and that's being uh, charged back to the internal service fund. Um, just recently, uh, I noticed a, a new Vactor truck uh, which I caught, I we found out cost about four hundred thousand dollars, and uh, I don't know if any other other councilors we didn't even know that that was purchased. So I mean, I'm not picking on on the public works at all, uh, but uh, you know, just curious how that came about. It might have been over a several year period, which I believe ha happened, uh, but uh, you know, it's something that we didn't hear about, and I just see it driving around the street with a city logo on it. Uh, I, 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 Councilor, Councilor, I want to be oh, very sure. clear that that truck was saved for over a four year period of putting dollars away, That's went, out through our, went out through our bidding process in July, and that truck has been operational since December. So it's not something that brand new just showed up. It was in budgets, it was in reserves, it was funding. I don't want the impression that all of a sudden the city and or department heads just went out on their own and said, hey, let's spend $400,000 on the Vactor truck. Um, I, I can point out to you, I mean, if you want to turn your budget books to page, you know, 98, and I'll just, you know, use the police, uh, or that's public works. I mean, let's go to uh, page 90. You know, and just focus on internal service. So the two components towards the very bottom of the page are vehicle replacement and vehicle repair. And when we allocate funds through the budget and through the CIP for police replacement, those are the dollars that they work with. There's not, well, we got money and now we can go out and just spend above and beyond. If for some reason something came in in a bid or there were add-ons, we're, we're charged with finding dollars that have been approved in the budget. We do not have an open checkbook and money just doesn't get spent above because um, somebody wanted a truck and, and not a cruiser type of thing. But, but really what probably happened over the year, and this predates me and it most certainly predates Glenn, is unless you start going with the vehicle repair and you're updating cost of tires and you're updating cost of fuel and you're updating mechanic salaries and benefits and really spending a lot of time in figuring out what your true costs are every year, I'm guessing it probably got adjusted every couple of years of, hey, we're running behind on the ISF, we need to bump up. The reimbursement rate a bit and i think it was probably done casually i'm not knocking anybody for it because to really cover all the vehicles and all the pieces of equipment that we have and all the components that go into it it's a lot of work to update every year and i think it was just handled a little bit more um casually over the years until it grew into a number where we went hey this isn't working so we've put some steps in to be able to identify and, and make those changes um, going forward, so we don't fall back into into that rut again. Um, but every vehicle that we purchased is coming through the council, and no one just went out and said, "Hey, let's get a Vector truck." And miraculously, the funds appeared. It was planned for, 
um, as that you heard from the chief tonight, he's planning for ambulance replacement on a five-year cycle. He's looking at ladder replacement. And that's why there's a six-year CIP. He's, and you know from sitting on the CIP committee, typically these items roll in, especially if they're bigger ticket items, several years in advance so we can start lining up the years and balance them out so that one year we're not trying to spend $10 million on capital and the next year it's only $2 million on capital. That's why we have a six-year plan across all departments, the committee reviews and prioritizes, um, and, and that's how we do it. So I, I just needed to jump in because if you look not only in police with their vehicles, you see it in public works, you see it in fire, you see smaller components in assessing or planning because they all share some pooled vehicles. Everybody gets an allocation. We track vehicles, who's using them, the miles that are on them. Um, and again, I think we're taking something that has, has slipped and, and not been as accurate as it should be right now and putting a system in place that I think will work very well in explaining and making recommendations to the finance committee to address it going forward. Okay, that's fine, Scott. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I remember calling you uh, last week and uh, you didn't know about the VACTA truck either, but we can move uh, on. And, and I understand, Council, there are hundreds of pieces of equipment. You. You called me three weeks ago and said, did you know there's two new condos going up on Endicott East? And I said, no, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And you, you were joking, I know, when you said, well, you're the city manager, you should know everything. And part right. of my answer is no, we've got great department heads and I have a great team and I put trust in them and I don't stop and micromanage who did what, when. That's not my style. And if it was my style, probably most of these senior department heads wouldn't be here right now because we've got a good trust relationship. They know when to approach me on things. Um, you know, it's a long time when you go out to bid on a specialized piece of equipment in June and you finally take delivery on it in December. I mean, we built the fire engine a year ago and took delivery on it two months ago. So some of these things, yes, they blur year after year um, in this business. Great. Uh, what, one question for West. Uh, I appreciate uh, they went out and uh, did the sod repair on Lafayette Street. But what I was wondering is, could they stake that, West? Because it's going to end up the cars are going to drive over it again. They already and, planned it. It's just a matter of timing uh, on when we get it. So we're, it's on the schedule for this week sometime. Okay. And Gerard Street also? Uh, Gerard Street, they got some more work they got to do on it before we go out. They got to do the other side too. Well, well, very good. Thank you, West, and uh, thanks for the great job your department does. Thank you, Councilor Hamill. Anyone else? Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I see no one has raised their hand. Uh, Wes, I'd like to thank you. Great job, great presentation. Um, Councilor Lipman, is, uh, correct me, is there a finance committee meeting after this meeting? Yes, I think um, there is one. I'm not sure we have to adj adjourn this meeting or not to uh, continue. I thought the manager thought we would be using this meeting as a continuation or something to that effect. Maybe you can correct me, Scott, if I'm wrong. Yeah, I think you can stay on this Zoom link, but I think you adjourn this as a council meeting and then you would call the roll and establish the finance committee, but you can stay right here. Okay. All right. Uh, the other thing is before we um, adjourn, is there any other business to come before the council? Councilor Ching. I'm hoping we can uh, start having our council meetings here in the chamber. Uh, starting next Monday. I, I recognize that some members may still want to zoom in. I think that can be done, um, but I think it's time that we get back to opening the doors and having the people around the table. The thought I don't know that it rises to the level of making a motion, but I would ask that the mayor pro tem discuss with the mayor potential to start. I will certainly, yes, I will certainly do that. Uh, Scott, is there anything, Council Will, I and mean, then I'll get to you. Scott, is there, do you have any comment? No, obviously things have um, 
have changed a, a little bit relatively or, or rather quickly, I should say, in the past week or so. I think um, some of the CDC recommendations of, of not wearing masks, in particular outside, um, has come into play. I think uh, I, I've seen a reported that it caught some of our state public health officials off guard uh, that that came when it did. So, um, and then I know there was an announcement from the White House, mainly again, I think regarding with with outside and, and people who are fully vaccinated. Um, it's certainly something that um, I'm, I'm meeting with senior department head staff and I've already had some one-on-one -on -one conversations today uh, but meeting with them on Thursday and it'll certainly be a prime topic of conversation about where we are within our buildings um, because generally we have followed um, CDC guidelines and obviously the state's, uh, the, the state's uh, mandates as well regarding um, leaving the state and quarantining when that was in effect and, and um, you know, the New England states being treated differently than the other states as far as travel goes and, and all of that type of stuff. So um, we will be discussing it. Um, I want to get a, a, a comfort level with, um, you know, again, senior leadership in our buildings as to what they're hearing from, from their staffs. So I can tell you that as soon as... Um, you know, that announcement hit from CDC, I think it was last Wednesday or Thursday. Um, some of my department has reported that within minutes, staff was <laughs> reaching out to them saying, yeah. hey, can we take our masks off now? And, uh, and the, the party answer, which has been, when we have a change in our policy, we will do it uniformly across all departments and appropriate people will be uh, notified all at the same time. So um, we'll be reviewing it within the city. We'll be discussing it. Um, you know, there's still some mixed feelings about in the buildings, you know, and, and I believe still encouraging folks who have not been vaccinated to wear a mask. And I think that is the, the guidance that was issued. Um, one of the, 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 the flies in the ointment, if you will, is we can't ask anybody to verify the, you know, show us a vaccination card or that type of stuff. So it's, um, you know, and, and even there might be, there might be situations that, you know, maybe we do lessen the, the mask, um, requirement for employees, but still in certain situations, if somebody is going in and doing an inspection in a crowded bar or going into tight quarters for whatever reason to be doing something, we may say, you know, hey, that's still a time when we want you to wear it. So, um, you know, so, can, can you have public meetings and, and still have a Zoom option? Absolutely, you can. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Lutman, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I just observed being down at the state house and, and around state government that, you know, the that while there is some relaxation of it, if you um, and I don't mind having an in-person meeting as long as we have a better um, social distancing ability within the council chamber. It's not the council chamber is not an adequate space to to spread out enough between us, um, nor for the public to to do so if we wanted to go back to the to the place where we were having in-person meetings i certainly wouldn't have any objection to that but i do have an objection to the current council chamber and its size and ceiling height and everything else is not conducive to good infection control okay thank you council Lutman. council cheney i, I uh, understand council Lutman's concerns and I recognize the manager's comment about we can't ask people whether they've been vaccinated, but certainly we, the members of the council, can volunteer to uh, assure everyone we've uh, been vaccinated. I'd be happy to show you my veterans card that says I've had both shots. I suspect others would be one too as well. So hopefully, Henry, that would help minimize concern. Thank you, Council. Um, I will, Council Cheney and the rest of the Council, I will discuss that with the Mayor. And Scott, I, I, I'm I, assuming that uh, once you have a discussion with senior team that you'll get back to us. Yeah, yeah I will. And I, and I think maybe just to follow up a little bit on Council Lipman and, and not trying to over dramatize anything, but you know, you've seen a couple of public examples of people who've been fully vaccinated um, who have contracted COVID recently. I mean, the, the New York Yankees had eight or nine <laughs> people publicly stated 
they're fully vaccinated um, doing it. There were 12 residents reported in the paper at the Sullivan County Nursing Home and three staff who were all fully vaccinated and past the time who came down. Now, granted, hopefully it wasn't as severe, and I don't know the specifics of any of the cases. I think some of the concern is some of these new variants um, are, are finding the way through the vaccine. And again, maybe not with a hospitalization and not with the deaths, um, but still could impact vulnerable people or those who might have some underlying uh, health conditions there. And so I can certainly see both sides. Um, you know, I, I would love us to get back to normal as soon as possible. Um, but I think we've made some good decisions as a city. I think you've heard Chief Biotti say today, you know, as our emergency management director um, in the cooperation and the coordination and the sharing of information, not only on the city side, but the school side as well, um, that, that, that we think we're in a good place and yeah, maybe maybe slow and steady kind of wins the race a little bit. So um, I, th I think we're very close um, and that's part of the conversation. You know, I, I don't make this decision in the vacuum. I don't, you know, rule as one person. Uh, I certainly want input from all of you and I want input, input from my department heads and I want to look at what's going around, you know, going along around the state as well. Thank you. Um, Henry, did you have a follow up? Yeah, just one quick thing. I just, you know, the house is meeting in person, but not in chamber. Um, right. The Senate is having, you know, in person, but spread out through the chamber. I'm just saying it's, I think, um, as Scott is talking about, you know, it's time to get back in person, but with some controls um, as these, you know, these breakthrough cases, there's been over 165 of them in New Hampshire so far. Um, you know, and they, the cluster that um, both the Yankees experienced and the Sullivan County nursing home. Um, it's, it's just there, it's not perfect yet. And, you know, it's not just about protecting ourselves because I believe we're all vaccinated now. It's about protecting all the other people we come into contact that may have vulnerabilities. Thank you, Councilor Lutman. Councilor Susie, did you have something? No, nope, I was going to wonder, to Councilor Lutman, do you think we'll ever get back to normal? Yeah, I, I do think that um, we will potentially get back to normal, but you know, I think you also heard that uh, this may be an endemic and not just a pandemic, and there may be um, practices that we'll have to sustain for a period of time longer to sort of defeat things. I mean, you know, think about how much to normal we have. What can't you do? You can you can eat, dine inside, and how you can. You can go to the grocery store if you want to wear a mask or not wear a mask. You know, it's, I think it's, it's when you're next to a person for three or four hours or, or in front of a group of people and exchanging uh, sometimes heated discussions that uh, it's not the, not the same as sort of passing by or, or having sort of a small group that, you know, just a, a risk level. I mean, I go to work in person every day. It's not and I, I go to state house meetings. It's not that I'm concerned about that. I'm just concerned about the environment that we have to sit in to accomplish it. It's not. It's not good. Okay, you, Council Lutman. To see us get back together. I know that you're. Uh, I, I don't know if you try to portray yourself as the expert in this area, but I just think we'd like to get ourselves back to this, uh, back to normal. Thank you, Councilor Susie. Anyone else? Um. Just a personal note, I'd like to thank everyone's indulgence. Um, this is my first rodeo, so thank you very much. Um, uh, the council meeting is adjourned at 9.13.